So we are Bubble Eyes. So uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you have never heard of Bubble Tea or never heard of um, Boba? So like one person. So uh, Bubble Tea, if you guys don't already know, it's one of the most popular beverages that's kind of taking the coastal cities by storm. And um, this was one of the things that I noticed one day when I was buying bubble tea. You know, I saw a line out the door, and um, my thought was, well, why the hell hasn't anybody bottled this? And like, why can't I buy it at a supermarket? Um, so one of the problems, I don't know if any of you have ever bought bubble tea and kind of tried to store it, is that if you buy it and you try to store it, the tapioca pearls, they either disintegrate or they get really hard, they get tough, um, depending on the composition. So um, we've assessed the market size to be about $7.8 billion, primarily in the coastal cities. Uh, but one of the things that we realized is that the market is very constrained because um, it's limited to being produced on site immediately fr and, f and freshly, freshly made. Uh, so what if you could bottle it and you could sell it to people in a ready-to-drink form? Um, so this would be like a $70 billion market if you could get it out there. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask you guys is, do you have any idea of the percentage of picture pictures on Instagram that are of food? How, what percentage of pictures on Instagram are actually people taking pictures of their food? It's a very big percentage. It's, it's, it's over 20%, okay? <laughs> I won't tell you guys the exact number because I want you guys to look it up yourself, but it's a really big number. So this is actually a trend all across America. People love to share images of their food or of things that are very beautiful. So one of the things that we realized is that one of the ways that you could essentially reinforce a kind of viral marketing strategy or kind of increase your marketing without really spending a whole lot of money is, well, you can put art on the bottle. And it turns out that some of the nicest uh, bubble tea stores, some of the higher quality ones, they already do this. Um, of course, you know, they have to make it immediately. So what we do is we deliver bottled boba artfully and emotionally to an end consumer. And we actually contract with local artists in the host cities where it's produced, and then we deliver art to people. So thank you. Thank you for supporting local artists and for giving us delicious things to drink. Hey, up next is Cooking Simplified. And these are recent alums. Come on up. Come on up. They are recent alums who partook in one of the, the neatest things we have at Berkeley. It's a class called Eat, Think, Design. Thanks. All right. Millions of Americans are facing an inequitable food landscape. Right here in the UC system, more than half of students have problems finding sufficient or healthful food. As former college and grad students ourselves, we've lived through the stress of meal planning, grocery shopping, and eating takeout and microwavable dinners to save money and time. We need a solution that makes fresh, homemade meals a more practical option for busy people on a budget. Dozens of companies like Blue Apron and Plated have sprung up in recent years, forming a $2 billion market to make that solution. But by and large, these companies haven't had the average cook in mind. Meals cost between $8 and $16 per serving, and they are out of reach for many people on limited incomes. That's where we come in. Cooking Simplified makes home cooking more affordable, convenient, and delicious for people on a budget by providing low-income meal kit, or sorry, low-cost meal kits with wholesome, diverse, tasty recipes that give boxed mac and, mac and cheese a run for its money. We're on a mission to advance health equity and food justice by empowering aspiring cooks who are currently priced out of the existing meal kit market. Our innovative tiered pricing model allows customers to pay between $280 and $680 per meal, a more realistic option for people on limited incomes. So how are we making this healthy, convenient meal kit at such low prices? We have three secrets. First, we're designing simple recipes 
using surplus produce, which we can purchase at prices well below market value. Second, our kits provide enough meals so the customers can cook in batch, which reduces the time that they need to spend in the kitchen during the week and reduces our costs. Lastly, we are collaborating with organizations and institutions like universities, schools, and hospitals to sell and distribute our kits more efficiently and more affordably. And this is where you come in. Our pilot tests have confirmed that customers are ready for Cooking Simplified to enter the market, but we need partners and supporters to help us get there. So please connect with us if you want to help Cooking Simplified bring greater health and equity to the food landscape. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks. Great. Okay, up next is KK Maway. And this is another fantastic outcome of Eat, Think, and Design. Um, an undergrad, no less. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. So how many of you have heard of the term geophagy? Geophagy is, uh, is a practice whereby human beings eat date or clay. This is very common among women in Africa. Uh, apparently, the, the preference for geophagy is between 10% and 75% across Africa. Malawi, in particular, 30% 30 30 of women uh, who are pregnant actually eat date or clay on a daily basis. They eat date as a remedy for nausea or sometimes as a snack when they're just chatting. Research has also shown that uh, this is usually induced by a condition called pica, where people eat not food materials uh, such as soil in this case. Um, like most habits we all have, uh, this habit uh, has its good sides and its bad sides. So the benefit of this soil eating habit is uh, the soil sometimes can contain elements such as uh, calcium, magnesium, iron, which are very beneficial to the women, especially when they're pregnant. But this same soil could contain uh, harmful elements like arsenic and lead, which, if consumed, could cause uh, neural defects to the women and children. And certainly we would not want these things to happen. So the goal of this product uh, was essentially to get as much of the existing nature of the, uh, of the soil eating habits while minimizing the potentially um, harmful effects. Therefore, that's why we come in. Meet Kekimawi, an iron-rich product that looks like the soil, smells like the soil, tastes like the soil, but it's not the dead. Uh, we have I tried to design this product that way it can look like a soil, and it's also nutritious, edible, and healthy for the women. Uh, we have thanks for the Clean Global Initiative. They gave us seed funding to prototype our, our product, and now we're in the testing stage. Uh, we hope to have the product out by July this year. Um, we did some uh, pilot research and found that approximately 100 kwachas, which is the currency in Malawi, is the good pricing point, uh, or equivalent 15 cents uh, to price it now. Uh, so we plan to right now, at that point, we expect that it's going to have about 1.3 million women between the ages of 16 to 60 would be the target market. Uh, but we're starting off with about 100,000 people. So uh, if that goes fine, we plan to expand out to not just Malawi, but other countries like Tanzania, Nigeria, Ghana, and the likes. So I can, as you can see, this is a potential, uh, it, it's a public health intervention that has a great potential in Africa. And we hope you can support Kekimawi. So therefore, support Kekimawi and join the revolution. Thank you. Great job of, of finding a problem and then crafting a solution and building a company around it. Really nice job. Okay, up next, Kiwi. This is also one of um, our launch teams, and they are also undergrads. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Felipe. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Kiwi. Uh, basically, Kiwi is an app to order food on demand in college campuses. We started in campuses in Colombia and Chile. And when we launched here in UC Berkeley, we realized that delivery fee for food in the States, it's really expensive. Sometimes you have to pay $5, between $5 or $10 plus tips just for food delivery. So basically, we built a robot, basically the first version we hacked an RC car and put uh, sensors and uh, computers, small computers in the car. And right now, we are delivering food with these robots. How it, exactly it works? We have right now five robots on the campus, and those robots have small sensors, and we use also computer vision to identify traffic lights and in which uh, crossing the streets is the robot. But each robot it, uh, have a person that is making surveillance and can control the robot. And we are using that uh, over LTE. Uh, like the week before spring break, in spring break, we delivered 100 orders with robots 
this week we are going to complete 150 deliveries with robots. And by the next month, we are going to be the company in the world with more deliveries handled by robots per day. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Awesome, that's even better than my bottler that I had. It's like a little robot at a hotel that delivers your towels, and I just kept harassing it by asking it to bring me things. This is even better, thank you. Excellent, okay, up next, Olive Better. Great, so this is undergrad, right? Okay, again, another amazing undergrad team, and this is out of a collider project with our friends across the street from engineering at the uh, Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and technology. Hi, um, my name is Shreya, this is Vruti, uh, and we're part of Olive Better, which is a tea company that's trying to help with the Greek refugee crisis. Um, as many of you might know, the island of Lesvos has become a focal point of the refugee crisis in Greece, and it's heavily affected the local economy, and we wanted to figure out something that we could do to help. Our team, while we were doing research, we found out that there is this incredibly valuable natural resource on Lesvos that's currently being completely unused, um, and that's olive leaves. So while olive oil is one of Lesvos' biggest exports and generates um, a lot of revenue for the island, um, the leaves of the olive tree, which have all of the same health benefits as the olives and the olive oil itself, um, they're just being burned or just thrown away. Uh, and that's where we decided to, to that's where we decided to come in. Um, so our solution is to buy these organic, unused olive leaves from the farmers on Lesvos and sell a line of olive leaf tea, which is the best way to unlock all those health benefits stored in the olive leaves. Um, and it is rich in antioxidants. It tastes just as good as green tea, if not better, um, and even more health benefits. We also plan to give back to the island in a couple different ways. The first is just by buying the leaves, we're immediately putting money back into their economy because right now the farmers just burn the leaves or use it as fertilizer. Second, through our website and our packaging, we plan to spread the story of Lesbos and the locals and refugees and really just spread more awareness about the refugee crisis. And Third, we also plan to partner with NGOs such as Lighthouse Relief on the island and give some of our profits back to help with the refugee crisis. And I think what really differentiates us is our story. Like Tom's and Warby Parker, we plan to bring life back to Lesbos by using its rich natural resources already on the island. Our team consists of other UC Berkeley students, and right now you can visit us at olivebetter.com, and we'll be around at the end if you have any questions. Thank you. Amazing. Berkeley has like the smartest students. We're all so lucky to be here. Emily, come on up. So Emily is a recent grad from Haas um, MBA program. She is a Dean Seed Fund winner and she's a current finalist in the Big Ideas food category. Thanks. So we live in a culture that doesn't value cooking. So that's why we didn't learn it growing up. And we grew up on Healthy Choice frozen meals. In college, you guys probably are eating a lot of ramen noodles. And as adults, you turn to Cooking Simplified and other meal kits to figure out how to cook. And it can be really intimidating. And you shouldn't be 25 to learn a life skill. And a lot of American parents in this generation feel the exact same way. 96% of American parents say that cooking is an important skill for their children to learn yet only a third know how to even bring their kids into the kitchen. So this is where Planet Merple comes in. We make kids media, as well as merchandise, that makes it so irresistibly fun to learn how to cook. And we start with four to eight year olds and their guardians. So how does it work? We've created a world of kale forests, of pepper skis, and these characters called the Murples that frolic all around and go on adventures that always lead to simple recipes. And what we sell is a set, these story cookbooks, as well as children's safe Murple knives, where kids can actually go on and start making recipes with their guardians. And more recipes, more adventures lead to more um, uh, skills that are learned as well. So 
what, uh, so far, we've actually piloted this. And we've learned that 81% of kids find Merple just as fun as their favorite toy. They love cooking. Um, we've also, in a pop-up event with uh, 20 families, all of them left in their exit survey saying they felt more empowered to actually bring their kids into the kitchen. And this is in Berkeley, too. So we just launched our website, and we just launched a bunch of new content on YouTube. So my ask is that you just check it out. Um, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to our newsletter, because this weekend we're actually releasing a really fun collaboration video with Imperfect Produce. So check us out, and thank you so much. Thank you, and, and thanks for being a great example of really getting out of the building and finding that product market fit, because I know Planet Merple has done a couple of pivots. Uh, this stuff is not easy, and you guys have been an awesome example. So thank you. Pop Oats, another launch team. Hello. So how many of you here eat oatmeal by a show of hands? And of those people, how many of you guys consume salty snacks, like ready to eat popcorn or sunflower seeds or chips? Got it. So you guys would definitely be interested in, if you haven't already tried our product, come and find us afterwards. We'll give you some. We started with an idea to pop oats similar to corn, sorghum, and amaranth grains. And with that process, we ultimately came to a product that is very crunchy, not as fluffy as corn. but most people say it reminds them of corn nuts and sunflower seeds uh, and also popcorn. And so uh, that would put us into the salty snack category, which if you were to go to your grocery store today, you will not find an oat option there. Most of the oats or all the oats will be in the granola section or oatmeal, and they'll mostly be sweetened uh, and have no savory flavors. So that's sort of the void that Pop Oats is uh, targeting to fill at the moment. Uh, we, all are, we are also experimenting with clustering the product together because some of the feedback we've gotten with, in our interviews has been that the product is uh, small. And so we're looking at that. We just had a snack hackathon on Monday with the UC Berkeley Food and Science Technology Club uh, with Claire over there. And uh, we had two winners, one in savory and sweet. We'll be selling a product clustered and unclustered varieties April 15th at Rogers Ranch Urban Farm. That's uh, the guy who's organizing it, John Matheson. And uh, <laughs> thanks. And yeah, so the salty snack category is like a $31 billion uh, category and providing a healthier option. Most people, when they think of oats, they're thinking healthy uh, oatmeal, granola. So there's this association with oats that they are healthy. Uh, they do have a lot of fiber and uh, other nutritional benefits. So that's Pop Oats, and uh, come try us if you haven't already. Uh, we're over here. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, up next is Tea Alchemy. Okay, oh, awesome. So these guys um, are a Dean Seed Fund winner, and just a little shout out for our Dean Seed Fund program. Uh, we give out $25,000 grants for super early stage ideas. We give out 10 in the fall, 10 in the spring. Um, anyone on campus is eligible, you just have to have at least one Haas student on your team. So for all of you guys who are you know, in other programs, uh, hug a Hossie and get your applications in April 17th. Um, hey everyone, my name's Claire and I'm a undergrad um, studying microbiology. Today I'm presenting tea alchemy. So what is tea alchemy? Tea alchemy is a artisanal tea concoction that is infused with uh, handcrafted liquor, healing herbs, and aromatic spices. Um, San Lugani, who grew up in a family of tea connoisseurs in India, came up with this idea when he first moved to America and realized how much people here love their liquor. And through Berkeley's Ling Launchpad last year, we, uh, he found Shubika, Jake, and me, who all share the same passion for tea. And after months of work, Tea Alchemy was born. And now I'm going to briefly walk you through three pillars that lie at the heart of tea alchemy. So first, we use all natural ingredients, like our organic tea is from family plantations in Darjeeling. And we macerated the tea leaf with um, spirits to extract the tea leaf, tea flavors, and the color. And our flowers, spice, and herbs are all sourced from um, Himalayan foothills. 
Second, the recipes we're using have been passed through generations from East Asian cultures. Lastly, what makes tea alchemy unique is the alchemy of infusing spirits with healing powers of tea, flowers, and herbs. And um, so far, we have done over 500 customers' interviews, including some taste testing events at tech companies like uh, DoorDash and Pinterest. And uh, we also spoke to some um, chef about like potential food pairing. And um, combining with the in-depth marketing research, we believe there's a need for our product. And we strive towards bringing the product to you. So presenting Tea Alchemy again, nature is our supplier, tradition is our driver, and alchemy is our elixir. Thanks. Great tagline. Thank you so much. OK, wrapping up is Uproot. This is another Dean Seed Fund winner, and Adam actually won Dean Seed Fund for this team and another team. So he is a multiple. This is his favorite team. Yeah. The best team. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam, and this is Liz, and we are the co-founders of Uproot. So growing up, I spent a lot of time helping my grandparents on the family farm. But unfortunately, over the years, I've seen them struggle. One of the problems that they face, as well as many other small farmers, is how they're going to distribute their produce. So they have two options. They can either go through a distribution channel that provides high margins, or one that has stable sales. Personally, my family chooses to sell at farmer's markets. And this is because they have the highest margins. But unfortunately, on today's, like today when it rains, almost no one comes. And you're left with a bunch of leftover produce. So what do you do? We turn around and you sell it to tiers of middlemen for pennies on the dollar. Direct-to-consumer sales like this, going from farmer to consumer, uh, represents only about $4 billion. This is relative to about $650 billion that consumers buy at US grocery stores of produce alone. So with that, it represents only 1% of the overall market, and we think we can do better. Uproot is an online farmer's market that aims to increase demand for local produce by really efficiently connecting small farms like Adam's family to local consumers in their area. So a farmer can pre-sell the produce, their fresh produce that they're picking, through the Uproot platform. And then on the days of the farmer's market that they're already attending, they can bring those orders. Uproot then facilitates the delivery from the farmer's market to the consumer's homes. There are currently 8,000, over 8,000 farmers markets across the US. So by using this business model, we can tap into an existing network. And we also eliminate the delivery or the wholesale and inventory costs that a lot of food delivery programs struggle with. Yeah, so additionally, we think by creating a network of farmers, one of the key areas where we can really add value is by working with farm suppliers to then provide uh, very efficiently products and services to farmers that uh, they currently can't access. So we are working on our prototype right now and are partnering with the local market for a beta launch this summer. So stay, stay tuned for that. And if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Nice. Thank you so much. All right, before we get to the main event, let's just have one more round of applause for all the teams. This is really above and beyond coming out tonight. Thanks to all of you. So I want to introduce Will Rosenzweig. So he is the original gangster, the godfather, and the king of food here at Haas. Um, many of you know him through his class, Food Venture Lab and also through edible education. I know a bunch of his students are, are here tonight. Um, but what you may not know is he is, among many other things, and I'm only just gonna pick on this one thing, um, an author of a book that you guys should all get. It's called uh, The Republic of Tea, How an Idea Becomes a Business. He is the founder of The Republic of Tea, and ask him anytime, and he will tell you some very interesting stories. So, um, it was also named one of the 100 best business books of all time, so check it out on Amazon. And um, I could go through your resume some more, but um, <laughs> it's all good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm going to put this down. There you go. I'll give it back to you. Uh, it's really it's, it's fun to be here. Um, 
I'm reflecting back, I'm thinking back to the 30 years ago when I started to think about going into the food business and starting a business. Um, it was a first wave, really, of real food innovation. And probably 30 years ago, and this was when many of your parents were um, caught up in a very industrialized food system, even more industrialized than we have now. And there wasn't a lot of choice. And um, a number of people who were active in the 1960s, sort of in protest movement, in trying to take back um, more rights for individuals, started to focus their ambition on the food industry. And there started to be kind of a challenger energy around getting food, a lot of it organic, um, not processed, uh, more direct from farms, more transparency to market. And there was a birth of a kind of a super premium food category, which we called organic and natural. It was really the convergence of organic and natural. And then Whole Foods, which was a small regional grocery, right, started in Texas, in Austin, and then they had an outpost with Peter Roy in, in New Orleans. They started to kind of team up, and this really interesting convergence of entrepreneurs and dis distribution came together. And I got kind of caught up in that. I went to a conference in 1989 for something called the Social Venture Network. This was kind of a nutty idea. This was sort of entrepreneurs thinking that they could change the world through business. And I, I went to this conference. It totally changed my life. And um, leaving that conference, I met a guy who would change my life. And we ended up starting the Republic of Tea. We shared a bunch of letters, which Rhonda mentioned, which became a book. And that book told the story. It was really my story of being a wantrepreneur, being a 29-year-old with a one-year-old child, needing to figure out how to feed ourselves and trying to do something good in the world. So I, this book is interesting because it really expresses how you design values to create competitive advantage in a business. And when I was writing my ideas, I could have never told you that that was what it was about. I only learned that by teaching at Berkeley. So in the late 90s, I was asked to teach what I had learned about how do you develop a social venture. And I was the first person here to be asked to teach a course in social entrepreneurship. That was in 99. What's really interesting is now Haas and Berkeley, as you would expect, is a hotbed for this kind of ingenuity. You know, and I think it won't be long before we're not differentiating social entrepreneurship from entrepreneurship. I think that's the next step, because all entrepreneurship needs to be mindful, enlightened, social. Now, we live in a world where, where that's where competitive advantage is created. And um, so now, what I love seeing, and I just want to pay kind of tribute to it before our special guest starts talking, is that Berkeley is also now the hotbed for food enlightened food innovation. You just saw a little taste of it tonight. You got a taste of it. It's really fantastic. And what is at the heart of this, and what's most exciting to me, is to see the cross-campus cross-pollination of the different disciplines, and even the different ages, classes, graduates, undergraduates, computer scientists, public health, public policy. It's all coming together. The edible education class, which has 210 students in it, is just a fantastic reflection of that. And so if you look now that people actually choose Berkeley because of its commitment to progressive business practices, the next wave is going to be progressive food practices and businesses. And it's through food, really, that we're going to hopefully eat our way out of the problems that we've got, because it's through food that we understand our interconnection to health and the environment and to each other. So interconnection, interdependence. And there's nobody in my sphere of inspira inspiration that better embodies that than Michel Nishan. And we're really lucky to have him here tonight. And I want to thank Rhonda and Adiba for organizing this. Michel hails from the East Coast. He's not part of the Bay Area ecosystem, but we got him here last night to speak to Edible Ed, and I asked him, could you please spend one more evening with us at Berkeley so that we could have an entrepreneurial 
uh, evening. So Michelle is, um, in addition to being a celebrated chef and entrepreneur, he's a three-time James Beard Award winner. That's like getting the Academy Award in the food <laughs> business. Not too many people get three of them. Um, he's a lifetime Ashoka Fellow, for those of you that follow that world of social impact and social entrepreneurship. And he's the founder of Wholesome Wave, which has gone on to take on really one of the thorniest issues in our culture, and that is the lack of access to affordable, healthy food. And so I just want to give a warm welcome to Michel. I, I asked him tonight to spend a few minutes just to be sure to tell him tell all of you what he's doing, and, and don't forget tonight to ask people how they can help you, okay, too, good. all right? So without <laughs> further ado, Michelle, Michelle. Thank, I, I will do that, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great, super. Okay, let me see if I remember how to do this. Wow, look at that, oh my goodness, we're like, we skipped ahead. I love it, okay, so Wholesome Wave, I'll just give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit of context, a little bit of background on Wholesome Wave, what it's all about, um, and a the, the personal history of mine that, that kind of, um, you know, led, led to the founding of Wholesome Wave. I was um, very, very much like one of our entrepreneurs. Uh, I, I grew up working on my grandfather's farm. Um, myself and all of my cousins and my older brother were the free farm workers because they could no longer afford to pay farm workers, and uh, so I learned how to cook at an early age, became a chef as a survival mechanism, because at least I could eat, get two good meals a day, and get a paycheck. Um, and I, it, it worked out for me. About halfway through my career, uh, one, one of my sons was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, so I learned the connection between food and human health. Um, started changing the way I cooked in the restaurant, realized that I was feeding my customers differently than I was feeding my family, and one thing led to another. Um, and I started organizing um, my business life around the values and the awareness that I had really come to realize as, as a chef who was watching the food system change away from the way I was raised on my grandfather's farm, as well as the impact the food was having on human and environmental health. Um, it was in the middle of having changed my career to creating a cuisine of well-being based on local, organic, sustainable, and no processed food of any kind, um, patting myself on the back for having accomplished this and then realizing that I could only do it because my customers could afford to spend 30 to $50 on an entree and that there were tens of millions of Americans who couldn't even afford a ripe tomato for the dinner table. So that's what we focused on. 64 million people um, that can't afford the basic ingredients to put a healthy meal on the table. Um, these folks definitely were not eating at Heartbeat Restaurant, and believe it or not, they're not eating at McDonald's and buying value meals either. Those are $5, and when you look at the economics, of what a food stamp consumer, sorry, a food stamp citizen, a citizen struggling with poverty who relies on food stamps. Will and I are having this conversation about the word consumer. Um, when you look at the resources that they have available, it's not, it's $3.50 a day in food stamps, a value meal is $5. It's not value meals. Um, so when we, when we looked at this population in the number 64 million people, that's 20% of all Americans, don't have the financial resources to put a healthy meal on the table for their family. That's huge. So when we look at some, a population that big, we have to ask, you know, first of all, when we quantify that, what do they spend? It's $133 billion a year they spend in retail food, $70 billion in SNAP or food stamps another 51 to 91 cents of their own money, $133 billion. That's more than half of Walmart's global annual grocery sales. It's a big marketplace. So when we look at this big of a marketplace, we had to ask the question, could we shift the way this gets spent? Is there demand within that marketplace for healthier food? if we wanna shift it. So we had to look first at what they were buying, and this is what it is, we've seen this before. Highly processed carbohydrates, uh, instant rice, condensed soup, either one of those carbohydrate packages 
You can actually, college students do this, you can actually stir the condensed soup in and have what we call poor man's risotto and actually stretch those boxes to feed six people for less than $5. This is what's going on the table for dinner tonight. So we took a look and asked the questions, is, is, it, is that really the main staple of the table because it's lack of access? Is it because lack of education? If people actually could get to broccoli, would they actually know what to do with it or how to incorporate it into this meal? Or is there the cultural context? You know, when somebody is struggling with poverty that comes from, it, is from an immigrant or refugee culture, are they going to even want broccoli? So um, those are the popularly held conceptions of why this is the main staple on the table. Um, but to understand the true answer, we really had to really understand that economic context. We look at this is kind of the idea of the healthy meal, right? You got some, some clean animal protein, not too much, some really great vegetables, some sweet potatoes, some grains, some greens, a little bit of fresh lime. And if, if you had the access, if you had the education, and on the Left side, on, the, on the left side of the plate, you had the cultural context that equaled the things that actually make it a healthy meal. Any family struggling with poverty should at least be able to put this on the table because it's only $3.56. But we have to remember that that's the entire food budget for a day for one person on food stamp. So if that's what they're going to eat, that's all they're going to eat. So this is what's for dinner. If you look at something like Easy Mac, you can do that three times a day on a food stamp budget, still have a little bit of, of, of money left over. So when we looked at that economic conundrum, it, there's a reason why that's 88 cents. You look at the price supports that are out there in the world, the subsidies and everything, that stuff is artificially cheap. Fruits and vegetables are not subsidized. So we decided to raise private money to do a minimally viable product launch or approach to actually level the price playing field between the artificially cheap stuff and the stuff that was too expensive to put on the table by doubling the value of SNAP benefits or food stamps when spent at a farmer's markets on locally grown fruits and vegetables. We started in three states and 10 markets in early 2008 by 2010, we were in 26 states and 300 markets, and had been invited by members of Congress to explain the incentive phenomenon, and were successful in the 20, 2012 Farm Bill, which eventually became the 20, 2014 Farm Bill, getting the food insecurity nutrition incentive into the Farm Bill, which is funded at $100 million, $100 million in federal funding requiring an equal private sector match to double food stamps when spent on fruits and vegetables. So that was a big win for us. Um, but it's only four one hundredths of a percent of the amount of money that's spent on food stamps in a year. So it's a small amount of money. So when we look at the idea of shifting the marketplace, we have to look at other policy targets that are actually really, really big. In 2007, that was the cost of diet-related disease, diabetes, heart disease, uh, hypertension, et cetera. All things that are caused by diet or could be prevented by diet, and some of the horrible long-term effects greatly mitigated by diet. And by 2015, that's the number, $1.4 trillion. In the current political environment, the Republican leadership has been told any new ideas or any funding for anything when we look at things like the Farm Bill, whatever the Affordable Care Act will eventually be called, but there will be some kind of Affordable Care Act. Any innovations or any money that's going to be spent has to be spent and budgeted through the lens of reduce, reducing the national debt, which is $19 trillion. So the current chair of the of the uh, House Ag Committee has looked at programs like the McGovern Dole International Food Aid um, legislation at $1.7 billion a year and has decided as much as he loves the program, he's gonna have to set it aside because as a responsible lawmaker, um, can he spend that money and leave his grandchildren with a $19 trillion debt 
which is a valid thought. But 1.7 billion divided by 19 trillion is nine ten thousandths of that amount. So we have to find a thousand more things at $1.7 billion to cut to get to the 19 trillion. Or we could aim at that, which is 5%, and find 20 of those. So that's what we're aiming to do. So our new innovation is a fruit and vegetable prescription program where we work with doctors and nurse practitioners in public hospitals, community health clinics, where an at-risk patient and their family can get a prescription that they can exchange for fruits and vegetables to avoid things like diabetes. The cost of one treatment for one year for one patient of dialysis is $96,000. For that same amount of money, we can increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables of 250 people, two servings a day, enough proven by science to help 20% of those people avoid diabetes. $96,000 present prevents $6 million in dialysis treatment. So um, our, our, our aim is to see that governments and businesses see the wisdom in investing in, in food at the front end before a diet-related disease happens, rather than paying for expensive med medical treatments at the back end. And that is what Wholesome Wave is all about. And I'll finish there, okay? I hope I didn't take too long. That Sorry great. about that. No, that was all right. Um, cool. And everybody's hanging in there because it's a rainy night okay. and it's later than we normally start this. But what's mm -hmm. what's so interesting to me about this is you you've chosen an you know an entrepreneurial path. You you know you saw a really big market. Mm -hmm. That's what you know you heard that in the pitches tonight. You know everybody's right. talking about how big the market is. Um, you know you're going after really big things that now there's you know incontrovertible evidence, scientific evidence, showing that you know, diet and lifestyle does prevent all these diseases and these costs. But what I love about what you're doing too is you're going, you've got a sort of a behavior change and then coupled to a policy change. And I just want to kind of underline that because I think that's the home run in food innovation. It's not just going to be in the future you know, coming up with a new, forgive me, you know, kombucha. <laughs> um, it's going to be about coming up with a product behavior policy combo. Mm. Or, or, or a product behavior that influences policy. Right. When, when we look at the current food system, you know, there's a popular belief that, that it's this evil empire move out of greed by the military industrial complex, which actually was not the case. At the time, if we can recall, we had first the war to end all wars, um, but then just a couple of decades later, we had another one, so that then we had World War I and World War II. So the popular mindset right after World War II was there's gonna be a World War III, and one of the main reasons why the United States actually helped the Allied armies prevail and win the war was because we could produce and deliver to the field to the fighting theater more food faster than the access powers, than, than the enemy powers could do that. So the, the, the need to, with World War III looming, to produce as much food as possible, put it into, get as many calories into a package as light as possible um, that could last 10 years, whoever could do that, was going to be the nation or a group of nations that would prevail. So mm -hmm. it, it was this alignment of public agreement, um, private agreement, the private sector, the military all got together and said, this is an effective and viable and justifiable use of taxpayer dollars to create a system that allows us to put food into this condition. So that the intention was actually good, but we had no idea the impact of processed carbohydrates on human health, the farming practices of just pouring unabated uh, industrial nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus into the soil. Um, we had no idea. I mean, now that we know that that's the truth, you know, there's an opportunity to change that. The, the interesting opportunity for us, though, is to realize that, you know, um, 
diet-related disease is now the number one killer beyond smoking. More people die of diet-related disease than have died from the last five wars. Um, there are 70,000 amputations a year from type 2 diabetes, and in the entire Gulf conflict and Afghanistan conflict, 1,500 amputations from war. But we get emotional about the war amputations, but then the 70,000 and the impact of that on people's lives and the expense. You know, so, so we need to almost like, how do we declare war? How do we look at, at the death and the dismemberment and all of these things that are happening as a result and, and the costs, the financial costs? We could literally eat our way out of the national debt, to your point of what you said earlier, if we shift the way that $133 billion is spent to reduce that $1.4 trillion cost. Well, I think the other th policy opportunity. I think the other thing that you're illustrating so beautifully, and, and I think all foodpreneurs need to be thinking this way, is you're really seeing the system and you're describing the system and the interconnections. And so um, the other thing that comes up for me that you're, you're talking about is really the unintended consequences of our technological innovation. Yes. And um, you know, you just played out. Okay, well, we had tremendous. You know, the military was really involved in, in fueling all of the food processing technology of the '50s. You know, they yeah. funded it all. Absolutely. You know, every canning and mm -hmm. processing, all of that, all that food safety stuff. Army marches on its stomach. The army, the army funded all that, yeah. and um, but now. You know, we're coming in a time where we're actually seeing the implications of the unintended consequences of technology play out right before our very eyes. So we see neocannotinoids, which are supposed to, you know, improve productivity in the field because they kill insects, also kill the bees, which mm -hmm. pollinate mm -hmm. all the crops, mm -hmm. which create the majority of the food we eat. So, um, you know, I think one of the things we're trying to embed in entrepreneurial studies here at Berkeley in particular is this kind of sense of responsibility to consider the unintended consequences of our decisions, particularly yeah, when we're playing with new technologies that we might not know, you know, how they're going to play out in the yeah. long term. So. Well, you know, what I, I like to think, think of it in the context of what, what's the ultimate duty of the CEO of an organization. And my, my understanding always has been that it is the CEO's job to look 30 years into the future. Mm. Yeah. If we're going to innovate and if we want to be a relevant brand that drives the type of public benefit and the brand loyalty that allows this company to outlast its founders by generations, how? How do we set up for that? Part of it is trying to determine, are, are there any, could there be any unintended consequences to this work? Um, and being able to kind of design around what happens if something goes wrong? What happens if there's an emerging science um, that actually puts your business model at risk? And are, have you designed your business enough to be nimble enough to respond to something like that? Nimbility is something that often, you know, for the sake of the idea, the ideas for some entrepreneurs are like mission statements for some nonprofits. It's like people so fall in love with the mission statement that something happens in the field um, to the sector that you're trying to be of service to, and you would, I've seen leaders ignore the changing realities in front of their face to hold holy their mission statement. Right, but, yeah. but what I love about what you're saying is to be able to hold this tension between a 30-year vision yeah. and then the short-term requirements of executing. You know? yeah. And I think you know, in the food industry, um, the consumer products industry, the, the, the leader and the company that's probably done that best is Unilever, mm -hmm. you know, because the CEO, Paul Pullman, right. basically yeah. said, hey, we're not gonna report quarterly results anymore. We're not gonna become beholden to short-term, you know, um, analysts reports on what we're doing. We're gonna take a much longer view. Yeah, so and I think smart. that that really holds true, you know, very important for the food industry because the kinds of challenges that we're working on, these are generational. Mm. And so, 
I just want to encourage all the teams here to be thinking about the long term and to set a course and an ambition, you know, with what you're doing that when you think about when you have kids or, you know, in 30 years from now that you've really created systemic change through your entrepreneurial venture. Um, we get really caught up here in the tech uh, kind of mindset. And we were talking about this earlier is it seems like I went to a Google, I, I'm not even supposed to say that. I went to a <laughs> innovation lab last week at a big company in the valley. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was a lot of talk about moonshots. Like everybody wanted to do a moonshot, you know, and if it wasn't a moonshot, it wasn't really, you know, exciting. And um, I'm getting nervous about the people who are talking a lot about moonshots because we got a lot of problems down on this planet that we got to take care of now uh, because the number of people that are going to be able to escape, you know, Richard Branson and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, maybe they'll take some women with them so that, you know, there'll be some other people. I don't know, but I'm just, I'm going off now. But um, I want to say that, you know, the things you do don't need to be a moonshot. Right. They can be meaningful, um, they can be high impact. And I think what's so beautiful about what you're doing is you started you know, with this minimum viable product, you start with a small group of people in a farmer's market. Yeah, with and wooden you, nickels. With wooden nickels showing yeah, that this is like gonna tokens. be. Right, tokens, yeah. you know. And you got out there and did it, and then within seven years, got a hundred million dollar change behind what you're doing, policy change. Well, and it, it, it's a policy which is what we're excited about because yeah. it sets a precedent and it's actually harder once something makes it into a piece of legislation to get like rid the of farm it. bill. It's harder to get rid of it than it is to increase it. You know, so that, that opportunity to me is interesting, but you know, the, the, the real interesting thing to me is um, the, why we were successful is because we were actually able to prove that there was a market demand. We, we didn't, you know, we, when, when we just said, how are we gonna measure our success and articulate that? We felt that it was really important as, as much as, it, I have to use this language because it, it really resonates with policymakers, but, but to prove that people that rely on food stamps aren't clients and recipients, they're consumers just like all the other American consumers that motivate lawmakers to make decisions and, and companies that lobby Washington to respond to a concept um, to, to actually get people on the right and the left side of the aisle to actually understand that 60 million Americans struggling with poverty have a powerful impact on our food economy actually implies equity right it, from the get-go it's like mm. you change the way that somebody looks at and understands the opportunity to seize the moment in being able to m create an environment where people that spend 133 billion dollars can actually exercise their free right to choose to spend it differently because now they can afford the thing that they heretofore actually didn't have a right to choose. If you can't afford a ripe tomato, if you can't afford to buy it, do you really have a right to it? You know, so it's, that's like a bedrock American principle, but improving that that demand existed is what really motivated. And then we, we also measured the economic impact on farmers that participated. They put more land in production. They made infrastructural investments in their operations. This was a great small business package. So, you know, they're taking the language of business to Washington, to a city food policy council, is something that shouldn't be off the table for when you think and you want to think big about what your idea is, what your concept is, and how you want to deliver it. Um, when you look at the Unilevers of the world, they spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. They spend a lot of time in Stockholm. They spend a lot of time in Brussels. They, they understand the implications of how public policy and creating environments that makes, makes it easier for someone to get a tax break for a new kind of innovation that's going to have a significant impact on public health, that can fuel your business. That's a capital plan. Yeah. You know, um, 
You know, so, so I try to encourage people to think beyond just the model itself. Um, identifying the problem that you're solving to, identifying the size of the market that's available for your idea, that's great. But that gets you, that, that gets you through startup, it gets you through your first raise, gets you through your second raise, uh, the iterative process, and maybe gets you to a point where you can actually get to a public offering but now you're beholden to the quarterly return. So, yeah. You, you know, yeah. 20 years ago, there was a lot of debate about whether you could actually teach entrepreneurship. You know, the, the people oh, in the you know in the academy in the in 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 university, there was a lot of debate whether you know it was sort of a God-given quality or a personality set of personality characteristics or whether you could actually teach it. And there was a, a wonderful, the godfather of entrepreneurial education, Jeff Timmons, said no, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurial skills, skill sets and mindsets that can be taught and learned. And when I look at you, and I just, I wanted to sort of point this out to the students here, is that I see a couple things. One is you, and you didn't talk about it tonight, but you did last night. So if you didn't, if you weren't at our class last night, should definitely watch the video because Michelle talks about his upbringing. And I think um, what shaped your worldview and your sense of fairness and equity and justice, I mean, your values sort of were set up. You talked a lot about your mom and your yeah. family. So that was one piece. So you come with this kind of well-formed well set of core values, mm -hmm. personal core values. But when I listen to you and I look at what you do, in food, and I think this is so important in food, is you have a very evolved and refined aesthetic taste. I mean, as a chef, you I've watched you, you know, we've been in tastings yes. together. <laughs> and you know, I've been in- We cooked they, in your pe kitchen pe together. Yeah, people call <laughs> Michelle and say, you know, I want you to taste my new product because you know what good tastes like. And you know, we wanna make sure it passes muster mm -hmm. with you, so I've been in, you know, these bit, people prepare these really elaborate things just so Michelle can taste them. But you've got this. It's a pretty cool gig. You've got this, <laughs> you've got this refined aesthetic piece. Then you've got this um, numeric, you know, kind of financial. Like you're really looking at these ratios and these relationships and the size of this market and how this works. And so you're putting together this kind of, you know, beauty and facts mm. and then creating something that is wildly charismatic for people to want to mm. you know become part of and like you said last night once you got this prototype working all of these people wanted to fund it yeah, they it wanted crazy. to be part of it yeah well you know because it because it worked you know it, it and it's you know i i there were some these kind of like energy points um, that that led to just kind of identifying providing affordability as being kind of the key trigger, right? So the Kellogg Foundation invested millions of dollars to put farmers markets in low-income communities, and every one of them failed without the grant funding. Not one of them made it. Um, and the only feedback that they really got was from the farmers just saying, well, I guess they don't they don't want our food or they they don't want it you know they don't like it you know um, so there are a variety of assumptions that were actually published based on the farmers market showing up and nobody buying the food um, nobody ever actually sat down with any any of the of the farmers market customers and asked them you know, they, they didn't just, take eat think design at berkeley obviously no, they obviously <laughs> didn't um, you know so it's you know you know, we, when, when you look at all of the energy of why people weren't making food choices, the lack of education and the amount of money that was going into educate people, low-income communities, setting up cooking classes and doing SNAP, ed, a tremendous amount of money from the USDA goes into SNAP education, uh, where somebody will st stand in front of um, a class of mothers who get points for attending with their children and say, this is broccoli, broccoli has niacin, broccoli has, it's good for you. Here's an easy way to make a broccoli salad. Um, and then the parents leave, nobody goes to a grocery store and buys broccoli. And here's, here's why, not because 
they were insulted, though that approach is pretty insulting to someone living in an underserved con um, community struggling with poverty. Um, wasn't because they don't care about or don't like broccoli or don't think their kids are want to eat it or going to eat it. It's because they ran out of food stamps a week ago, and they have $2 to spend on a family of four for dinner tonight. <laughs> so when a head of broccoli is $2 <laughs> and an eight-pack of instant noodles is $1.49, what's going on the table for dinner tonight? It's not, it's not going to be broccoli. So, you know, you look at the money that was being invested, the energy behind, you know, public health education, what was being taught in schools was all geared toward a variety of assumptions that turned out not to be true. So when, when it hit and the incentives were creating things like people demanding that somebody tell them what to do with kohlrabi because it's 49 cents a pound with the incentive, it's the cheapest vegetable at the mar market, also the weirdest looking vegetable. You, how many people know what kohlrabi is? Okay, that's wild, right? right? You know, you know um, that, that's like exciting. The farmers are like, wow, somebody wants to know what to do with kohlrabi. Donors saw that and they went crazy. They're like, oh my God, that's, it's so simple, who'd have thunk? What an effective way to spend our money. You know, put, if it really is affordability, if we can put extra, a small amount of extra resources in the hands of somebody struggling with poverty and they immediately make a healthier food choice, that's a great investment. So that, that it surprised us. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised. I really thought it was a good idea and I really did believe that affordability was a factor, but I was shocked at the volume of yeah. interest um, and it just, it created this opportunity where we really had to reorganize the organization and, and set ourselves up for scale, which was a, a, a wonderful thing to have happen. There's so many lessons in what you've started to say, and we're going to wrap it up because yeah, it's getting sorry. late. And I uh, want to thank all of you for coming. Yeah, thank a you special so thank you to Michelle for spending an extra night in Berkeley, yeah, no, it's coming out pleasure. on a rainy yeah. Thursday. And thanks to all of you for coming in tonight. And thanks again to Rhonda and the Berkeley Entrepreneurship Center yeah. for hosting this fine evening. Right. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you.